All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask Julie Anything. Uh, we are here today with Julie Ann Lee and uh, also with Sarah Griffith. I can't remember all of the amazing things uh, that Sarah does, but she's, she has fantastic information um, on horses. And I'm going to let Julie explain everything because there's so much more. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, all, I'm very excited actually for this because I, horses are one of my mega loves as well. And um, we just don't have enough people out there talking about horses, especially from a more holistic point of view or nutritional point of view. And I am really excited to, to, to listen and, and speak with Sarah, but I think I'm more excited too, or not more, equally as excited, because I've known Sarah for a really, really long time. Sarah was a little itsy bitsy baby when <laughs> she uh, when she came to work for me at my vet hospital, the very first vet hospital, which was Adored Beast Veterinary Clinic when it was little tiny. And I remember her coming and 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 working with me, and just like all of a sudden exploding blossoming into this like amazing woman and kind of didn't really follow well I kind of followed in my footsteps a little bit right you mm -hmm. yeah I mean you she went back and she did the human the four-year ho human homeopathic medicine program so she's a human homeopath and she is an animal homeopath and she is a equine feline and canine nutritionist mm -hmm. And she trains horses and she does nutritional consults. We can talk about that later at the end so that people can know. But another really super, super cool thing that she's done, which a lot of people that deal with nutrition and animals never get the chance. And that's that she's worked with, with wolves, wolves and coyotes and bears and all kinds of bobcats and big, large cats and, and, um, uh, hawks and eagles and all kinds of really super cool stuff. So anyways, tonight we're going to talk about horses, but anytime, if you guys have any questions for, cause it's an ask me anything. Um, if you have questions about nutrition and, and large cats and cats or nutrition and, and wolves or just anything you want to ask, us ask away it's like two two very close yeah. friends having tea so um um just yeah make sure that you put your questions and answers in that question and answer box kaylin is that what you were just going to say well yeah and i also just want to mention to people if you have a specific adored beast apothecary um product questions uh, we don't really talk a lot about that on here but you are very welcome we would love for you to email us at questions at adoredbeast.com and uh, we'll be able to help you out there. Okay, so don't forget uh, the question and Q&A. Click it at the bottom if you want to ask. Yeah, and also um, I think that that like for Adored Beast questions, like product questions and stuff, I am going to do an Ask Me Anything um, on my own. I'm going to try and do that so that we can filter some of those, but the big, the big thing that I'm trying to do this with for now is to, is really from an educational point of view. So trying to get as many people educated as possible about all different things and not specifically about, I mean, products are great and it's really interesting to talk about certain products. Like Billy Hokeman talked a lot about answers and specifically about the food and so that's that's all great and fine, but as far as adored beast goes, I'm trying to kind of keep it separate so that it becomes this is predominantly educational. So, Kaylin, there are two questions. Do you want to start? To are they all adored beast? Or are they? Uh, well, it's from Julie G. Hi, Julie G. She was in our last uh, um, our last Ask Julie Anything as well, and she wants to know. Uh, she she's asking for some recommendations for ulcer treatment. Now I know this is something that a lot of horses suffer for from. So um, she doesn't say specific for, for what animal though. So maybe put that, yeah, okay. Uh, Julie, do you want to start or do you want me to start? No, I want you to start. I can, I'll, I'll <laughs> fill it up at the end. 
Um, so yeah, uh, ulcers are a, uh, it's it's really unfortunate how many horses have ulcers. Um, sometimes you don't even know your horse has ulcers, um, but if you do know your horse has ulcers, they, it, it's gotten to the point where they've shown some behaviors to you that have indicated that they're discomfort. Um, and a lot of horses, depending on how stoic they are, they won't even really show you too much until it's actually quite bad. Um, <clears throat> and then the other part would be, you know, it, depending on how, how you're going to um, be able to, to make a difference for your horse is going to matter. Like you have to have a starting place as to um, how, to, what, what, how does your horse live right now? What kind of workload do they have? Um, what kind of field access do they have? Are they, um, are they on crusher dust? Are they on grass? Are they on dirt? Uh, what do they live on? How much movement do they have? Um, how old are they? All of those types of things. And certain breeds sometimes have uh, more of a disposition for that. But um, uh, stress is a, is a huge factor. So it's always really important to determine. It's oftentimes something has to change in the way that you're um, housing your horse, feeding your horse, and or interacting with your horse. Um, and I find those three things, I think with horses, there's a, a huge emotional factor with horses. Um, and if you're not addressing those things that, uh, I, I feel that ulcers is something that is very easy for them to go into a state where they're stressed enough that they could ha get ulcers. Um, and we put them in some pretty unnatural, uh, situations for our own benefit. And so we have to look at, um, how we can make their lives as natural and easy and stress-free for them as possible so that they can do um, what we need to, what we want them to do for us. Um, so is proper stable management and things like that is really important. And, and sometimes the line between um, how you manage your barn for financial reasons versus what's best for the horse is those lines can get really blurred and so you have to take a look at like what can i do to to make my horse's life as stress-free as possible that's the first thing that i always look at yeah i think i think that the i was shocked about the um they said they say that probably 80 to 90 percent of all show horses and 90 yeah. percent of all race horses have ulcers and mm -hmm we always used to think that they were just um, GI, like upper GI. And so they could get, they could get tubed and see. And mm. now they know that a lot of, a majority of them that get tubed and they, and they don't see any, any active ulcers that they actually die while well, they wind up dying, but they they have lower GI ulcers that you can't see. And you can only tell through an autopsy that they've had them. And I think that, like we can, I think this is a big topic that we can keep just talking back and forth about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, for me, a big one is that horses just, I always used to say we feed dogs and cats like horses and cows and horses and cows like dogs and cats. And horses are made to graze 24 seven, like constantly be eating. And we, you know, a lot of people are getting smarter, thank God. But, you know, a lot of big barns, they feed them, you know, they throw hay into them in the morning, they give them massive amounts of grain, then they give them hay at five o'clock, and then they don't, ha and they, then they're eating this up, and they don't have anything. And they say that if a horse goes without eating for like, more than two hours, that they can immediately, an ulcer can start. Mm -hmm. So I think what Sarah was saying is so true, like uh, stress and you know, when you walk into a barn and you see all of these like chew marks in barns, like all the wood being chewed, yeah. to me, that's the first sign that the majority of the horses in there have ulcers because they'll, they'll chew they're on grazing. wood. They're, that's what they're doing, it's grazing on wood. <laughs> yeah. Right. They need to feel like they're chewing right or they're stressed or they're painful or whatever yeah. and you know when you see that or you see horse crib or you see horse weaving or you see like any kind of 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 science like that 
Um, and then I think that laminitis, which is another massive one, laminitis can be directly related to ulcers, mm -hmm. right? So they already have the ulcer and then they get laminitic, right? Or they get laminitic and then from the pain they'll get ulcers. But they often, often, often go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, I don't know whether she's on. I think she's, I think she's watching. I was speaking to... Um, uh, someone the other day about uh, she's been around forever like the, her nets for her horse nets but they're called nag nets oh, nag bags nag bags they yeah. originated in BC before I even left and yeah, we have uh, yeah and they're awesome 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 bags and I think that you know like having free choice hay for what that question like how do you deal with with ulcers having free choice hay in bags is ultimately like unbelievably important. And then I know that Sarah, we're not supposed to be talking about, about <laughs> products, but um, Sarah's researching my products. Like we're, we actually are having a, an equine gut soup. So I've got like seven rescues all with ulcers that I've been researching it on with for about three years now. And, um, along with a bunch of other stuff, but Sarah's now trialing it with some horses in BC that are, that are show horses and stuff. So, you know, stuff like slippery elm and L-glutamine and aloe and marshmallow root, right, Sarah? Like it's all, it's, it's stuff that actually helps them to regenerate their gut lining because they, um, the other thing that people do, which is a, it's a really it's so sad to me that uh, show horses a lot of show horses will go on something you guys some of you probably know uh what gastroguard is which is a, a tube it's a medication with uh with some aloe other things in it but it's a drug and it's 50 dollars a tube and people use it as a preventative they just give it to their horses when they go to those because they're afraid that they're going to develop an ulcer from stress, um, which is a unfortunate because if the horse is that stressed and they probably shouldn't be at that level of training, they should be, I mean, part of a horse's training is to, to desensitize them to things so that they aren't stressed when they go to a show, but I guess it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, but I'm hoping that, people can use something like this rather than using um, gas regard um, it, as a preventative and long term and you can use it kind of sporadically and add it to your um, to your feeding schedule and even do it seasonally um, which is what because uh, during the season changes there's always um, like their their gut microbiome changes depending on what they're eating and if they have any field access whatsoever they're what they're getting access to is changing over the season. So, um, so all of those things, but some horses are not even getting field time. So, um, that's why I chose to write that blog, that blog that we did, um, as grazing first over anything else, because the, the whole, um, the whole, uh, principle of proper horse management is to simulate, uh, what they need in nature but we've gotten a little bit discombobulated in that world. And it's because it's fairly expensive to really do that. Um, then people cut corners in different ways, but, um, and there are not a lot of barns that have, like if you're boarding your horse somewhere, there's not a lot of opportunity to have field time for your horse. So you have to hand graze your horse, which is a lot of, it's time consuming, right? Like, it's a lot of work and a lot of people don't have time, but it's so beneficial. And now that we're all staying home more <laughs> instead of driving to work, like that's how I've kind of looked at it is I actually, because our fields are too wet here, it, we have grass, but it's just too wet and they, it's still a bit dangerous to turn them out. So I actually hand graze my horse for two hours and I just stand there with him so that he, he can be, prepped for when he can go in the field. Um, so I know it's not always possible to do that, but um, 
even if they're getting four to five feedings a day, um, that's way better than two or three. Uh, and grazing is just so paramount to every health problem that horses get. So it's really important to assess if your horse is getting enough of that or if, if you need to change things uh, so that they can have more of that. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think people don't understand like, like uh, equine motility, right? Like they don't really have motility. They depend on their food to pass through their guts, to, to, to push the feces out, right? To push the manure out. Yeah. And I don't think people really understand that. Like they just, they, they just don't, I don't, maybe they haven't really read into it or maybe it's just a completely different concept that they need to eat to digest and to poop. Like that's, yeah, to actually move. They also have to move. And that's really important too, right? Because the move, actual physical movement is also part of their motility um, and combination of uh, good hay and or grass uh, a, on a frequent basis along with frequent movement, not really rigorous movement for an hour and then standing in a paddock for the rest of the time and then a stall at night, then those are other factors. That's why I always look at the whole lifestyle of the horse because um, there's usually a lot of things that need to be changed about how that horse is being kept um, in order to, like you were saying last week, Julie, like with when you're a homeopath, you always look at things that are what we call obstacles to cure and, um, and housing a horse in a stall and not giving them access to a field or some kind of space where they can move and graze is an obstacle to cure. Um, so we, we always have to think about that. And if you're, if you're listening to this, you're probably interested in um, a more holistic way of doing things and maybe just don't know how, um, because there's just a way that horse people do things. And we're so kind of like regimented horse people are very regimented <laughs> and we like schedules and things to be the same because it's good for the horses. Um, but definitely uh, it's, it's usually once you explain it to people, they, it's like an aha moment for them. And they're like, of course, that's what we need to do. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I ha I'm so blessed to have a vet here that is uh, not only my high school friend, but she's also very old school, like James Harriet style. You got, they got to move. They got to be moving. Like if they have an abscess, they have to move. Whereas a lot of vets will say, no, make them stand still. I'm like, no, I'm great getting on him and riding him around on soft ground at the walk because I know the abscess will come out if I do that. If he's standing, it's going to take forever. Um, so those kind of things like uh, finding a vet as well that's not um, looking at the horse as a machine um, and looking at them more as like a, an animal that came from here and now they're stuck with us. So how, how can we make it easier for them? Because we used to rely on them so much for our everyday lives, even 150 years ago. And now they really rely on us and it's really different now. So um, but it is a, it's a privilege to have them in our lives. So it's really important to make sure that we are, uh, making it a privilege for them to be in our lives too. <laughs> I remember we posted that thing that Willie Nelson did on them. Remember when, when, yes. was, um, he was saying about, and I've always said this, it's like, if it wasn't for horses, we would be nowhere. We wouldn't have transportation. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have, you know, railway lines. We wouldn't have been able to build stuff. We wouldn't have been plowing. We would have been like, like what, when you really think about it, and it wasn't even that long ago. It was just, I think they said that they lost, I don't even know, 50,000 horses in World War II, right? In yeah. like in battle, 50,000. And there was just, just in the last war, they were still, the U.S. still lost, I think, close to 15,000 in the, help me out, the, oh my God, I can't remember what war it was. Um, like, the, like a, no, a recent war, like, oh. like, like in, uh, no, 
maybe Afghanistan. Anyway, Sorry, Afghanistan. What, what he wrote was that every single war that the U.S. has been involved in, horses have been in. So up and up till every single last war, anytime the U.S. have gone in, they've gone in also with horses, and people aren't even realizing that, right? They just don't even. They aren't well, even. A lot of like where we are, we have. Um, like we have mounted police, right? And yeah. when we had we had a riot here, uh, uh, when the Canucks were in the Stanley Cup the last time, and there was a huge riot in the city, and I was stuck in a in a restaurant, and these horses had like gas masks, riot gear, and these people are throwing burning things at them, and the horses are just calm and steady and going, and to to for them to to do that for us <laughs> is such a huge thing. Like for me to get on my horse that I've had since I was, since he was, came out of his mother. And then for me to be able to like ride him and ask him to do these weird human things that I want him to do. It's so amazing to me that he's just like, yeah, let's do that. Cool. Let's try something new. Like he does it. He's not like, oh my God. But I think because um, I always like kind of stack things for them, make it easy for them and, and make sure that I'm not stressing him out. He offers me so much more. And I think that's something that's really important to remember um, to, to have a connection with your horse and to enjoy your horse as much as possible. You have to remember where they came from and you have to remember what they are and, and also how amazing it is for, for us to even, um, oh, did I lose you guys? You're still no. there. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> um, it's just really amazing to me that they'll even let us sit on them. Like to me, that's just amazing in itself. So I think, you know, we have these goals for them and we want to show them. And right now we can't show, which is really sad. And, um, but this is a great time to actually assess. Like it's a beautiful time of year. We can be outside with them more and not feel cold and whatever. And we can go on a trail ride and we can do some of those things that maybe we used to really love doing when we were kids yeah. um and we were too you know like especially i ride your song. connection like your, your connection with your horse rather than it being about competition or or yeah. what did kaylin what do you always say connection versus oh collaboration over competition over competition mm -hmm. yeah like collaborating yeah. with your horse and stuff i think it's a it's a prime time to reconnect with them for sure and Buck Brannaman, I don't know, you probably saw it. Did you see that documentary, the Buck Brannaman yeah. documentary? Yeah. And um, it was such a cool thing for anyone listening about horses. If you can find, it's called Buck. Mm -hmm. And it's a Buck Brannaman story. And he talks predominantly about, you know, just the whole mindset of training, right? And how, Break. how breaking, <laughs> breaking, right. And how... You know, if a horse really wanted to, they could kill you in like a second. Yeah. Like if they really, really wanted to, and we, and we just, anyways, let's, we're getting off topic, but I think it's an important piece to, to remember is the fact of how big they are, how much power they have and what they let us do with them. Like literally what they let us do to them. It's, it's incredible. Like, every day that I get on my horse, I'm like, I can't believe that we're doing this. I, I. I never thought that we would do this and now we're doing it and we're going to do more. But I think going back to like the holistic aspect of it and, and making sure that, um, I guess this goes back to the ulcer question. <laughs> we should not answer some more questions, Kaylin. <laughs> but the ulcer question comes down to a lot of times this has to do with stress. So uh, maybe we can talk more um, off offline about um, how to assess your horse's world. You can um, minimize stress and then you have a, a baseline for how to um, heal your horse's gut because that's, that's really the issue is their gut. They're so stressed that their gut is, is damaged. Is that the next blog? That we need to see uh, from you? It will be a blog, yes. yes. I'm definitely awesome. on all sure <laughs> um we have some more questions here um so 
uh, vet, V-E-T-T. -T. I'm not sure if that's a short form, if they're actually a veterinarian. Um, <laughs> says, do you have any information on recumbent sleep disorder? OTTB, 14 years raced, for six years went to a home after race career until February this year, then came to his second home. A dressage after racing career, think he might have RSD. Mm. Hope you know what that means, because I don't. I do. Um. Julie, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I have two of them. <laughs> so I, I thought that you had one that had it. So yeah, it's a it's a really really interesting. And it said he said he right. He did. Did he refer to it as a he? Okay. Yep. So yeah. So I I think a bunch of different things with that. I think it, I think it can come from PTSD from literally like shutting off. I think it can come from really, really, really poor microbiome because the microbiome basically gives the signals to the whole body and there's something that's shut off or, or, or uh, disengaged. And um, I also feel like it's, um, um, it can also be, um, uh, oh my God, I just lost my train of thought. Ah, help. Um, Oh my God, what was I going to say? I swear to God, I just like went brain dead because I was thinking of my, oh, hormones. I really think it can be, can be hormonally based because my, the two that I have are, are, are mares and they, they're worse when they're in season. Mm -hmm. They're way worse when they're in season. And the, the, and when you think of if this horse is a gelding and you talk about the, the, you know, not enough sex hormones, depends on how old they were when they were gelded, if they were gelded correctly, or just simply not enough. So I think it can be emotional, hormonal, and um, a physical microbiota issue. And, and with my girls, one of them is, um, oh my God, she's so much better. I know that if I see her do it, that she, she, there's an issue either with something going on with her that she's either going to come into heat or that she's, um, she needs more probiotics or she's stressed on stress somehow. So then I just, but she's like probably 95% better. Hmm. And do you, you use homeopathy with her? Oh, yeah. All, yeah. All, I always use homeopathy with everything. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that again is like a, a whole, like you got to assess the, the past history of the horse and a lot of race horses have some pretty weird habits and, and stress induced uh, issues. Um, and so that sometimes you actually have to be even more aware with them to, to really make sure that they're um, feeling secure and feeling um, that they have everything that they need. Uh, and, and sometimes they've gone beyond that point where they actually have some metabolic damage or they have some gut damage or it depends on what, um, stage it's kind of at and how quickly you can recognize it and, and get on it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important to just assess like what, um, what things could you do better um, and what, and in that process of, of doing that, you can kind of eliminate and, um, customize something that's going to, um, like you'll see what works and what doesn't work. And then you build a, a, a lifestyle plan or a health plan for them based on, uh, you know, trial and error sometimes because it's a tricky one. So you, sometimes things will not work and then you go, okay what about this and then you you always want to do kind of one change at a time in the beginning so that you know what's working and what's not and then um and then you know also assessing like your training plan um making sure that the training plan is not stressful either and dressage can be really um useful for them if it's being done properly um and it can be really stressful for them if they're um if they're not 
actually being ridden forward into contact and carrying their own selves. And because what happens when, when they are um, correctly going as a dressage horse is they actually, when they're moving properly and they're actually moving on carrying themselves they they release endorphins in their brains and you can actually feel it when you're riding them and you can see it um that they physically are feeling like the endorphins coming over them so all those calming signals like blowing and stretching and um you know their ears get floppy and they get really happy like you can tell when they're when they're feeling good you can feel it underneath you so um if you're feeling a lot of tension and um backing off and things like that when you're riding then that would be a place where you might have to step back in your training um and and go back a few strides or back a few steps to make sure the horse is really comfortable in their training too um, which can also help the the um, the physical problems that are going on. I am. Um, I was just trying to see because I actually took a video of her doing it, and I was just looking on my phone to see if I could find it. But um, uh, it is. I mean, it's it's a scary. It's a really scary thing too, right? Like to to deal with. But I don't know, Kellen, can you ask them um, like what they've done so far and has anything helped? Because um, um, is it progressively getting worse or is it better or are they better when, you know, like, do they see a trigger when it happens? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it, is it, is it coming and going? Is there something that they think that can trigger it? Um, vet is short for Yvette. Hi, Yvette. <laughs> um, if you're watching, if you could just maybe even pop in the chat and, uh, or, or ask another question and, and let them know, uh, you know, what Julie is asking. Cause the um, other thing that has helped my one horse a lot is, um, is CBD oil. Mm has helped yeah, really like julie said it's really important to note like when the behavior or when the when it's happening when it's worse and if there's any correlation to anything that's happening around them or or with their diet or with or with with you know if you're upset one day and you go and it's worse because you had a bad day and they take that stuff on um so it's really important to be aware of um you know the worst being 10 and kind of assessing it that way like oh today he's a one today he's a five today he's like an eight um and and really get a get a good feel for maybe what things might be uh making it worse Hi, and it could be emotional it could be physical and it could be <clears throat> yeah seasons our okay. horses are for such a big animal, they're very um, fragile. <laughs> um, Yvette says it comes and goes, I think. See scrapes on front legs. Cannot use CBD in dressage. Um, All right. Slowly changing since he has been here, but it's only been since the end of February. So it changes for the better? It, it sounds like the, it changed for the better. Well, I would do a lot of what Sarah was saying like for, for this, my mare, the one that's so much better now, she wasn't a dressage horse, but she was a um, really, really, really high level um, cutting horse. Mm. And it, there's huge, huge money in it, like masses, masses amounts of money. And it, it, it's like training a, um, a herding dog, right? Like they have to be so on and they use a lot of, spurs and they, they it there's a, a, a massive amount of damage on their bodies um and every time something would every time i would i, I started noticing that it that's why i said ptsd because i feel like every time something would happen where there would be a big shift in the herd she was way worse right because she couldn't control it she felt like she needed i think she felt like she was going to get in trouble if she couldn't con control her area because that's what she was sort of trying to do right and 
So, you know, PTSD stuff that you can use is homeopathy, intrasage, right? Homeopathy is, 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 it oh, doesn't test. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't test. Maybe you should talk to Sarah after about doing like homeopathic remedies prior to show, during show, during like, like a different, it's really for something that that's this severe and can be so debilitating and they can get injured so badly because they're such big animals. Um, there are different remedies that you use in different situations. So you could be working constitutionally on something like a PTSD, but then you could be using a certain remedy that help, is helpful for when they're in training and then a certain remedy that's helpful when they're actually at a show. But I, I feel like, you know, we're all into species oriented stuff, right? Like species oriented diets for dogs and raw food, dog, raw food, raw food for dogs. I think we really all have to, to step back a bit with our horses. And, and, and like Sarah said, we really need to look at what species oriented for, for a horse. And, and I'm all, I'm all about species oriented lifestyle, not just species oriented food. Even, I mean, I did a lecture in Chicago about, about species oriented lifestyle with dogs and how, how really important it is. You know, um, as I was, when I left Vancouver to move out here, Vancouver has such a much smaller space for horses, right, than, than we have. And there was a lot of people doing those um, paddock paradises and pasture paradises, right, where it, 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 it mimics, there's, you can Google it. It's, pre it's pretty amazing for people that don't have access or they're worried that they're just, I mean, the amount of people that I know that are so terrified of their dressage horses getting it like a cut, right? And they aren't even allowed to go out. The and, because they're in bubble wrap all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really, really hard on them. And these pasture paradises are so cool because they're, 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 they can be like a one acre thing or a three acre thing. And they, they try to mimic, um, movement so there's no grass right it's there it's it's sand and then there's some gravel and then there's water so that their feet go into different kinds of it's almost like reflexology for their hooves so they you know one minute their their feet are wet and then they come out of the wetness and then they walk on on rock so it starts to like wear their hooves I mean I know you can't do that if they have shoes on but but they they move it makes them move right so they've got hay nets every every so often so that they actually move from one to the next it creates movement it tries to mimic a natural horse lifestyle so you know for really for horses that are really suffering like that you know even to try and talk to your if you're boarding them even to see if there's a way that they could do some kind of even pasture paddock paradise or something you can google it and look at it it's pretty cool yeah it's like an enrichment uh playground for horses it's it's yeah. pretty cool um there's there's other things you can do too that maybe might not be as um as uh as big as that like there's a lot of times when i talk to people um it's smaller changes than that can even make a big difference and then you can yeah. kind of stack those smaller like really realistic things um on top of each other and make a really big difference and um, I find a lot of people who are really competition driven, um, you have to remember to have a connection with your horse. So I, I won't board my horse or take my horse somewhere where there's no round pen because I like to actually be on the ground with my horse. And like one day a week, that's all we do is we just do groundwork and we, you know, I move them around and then we hang out and I you know massage and like we we don't do riding things we don't compete we're not working on what we're going to show doing we're just hanging out and and be like I have to remember that he needs that interaction and he's a very social horse yeah. and every horse is social <laughs> um even when they're cranky mare they're still social and they still want to be bossy with another horse and not just have no horses so um they they really need that interaction and a lot of horses they don't really get as much socialization as they 
need um, with other horses. And so that's something that you can actually do with your horse because they really want to do that with you. And that's something that can really decrease stress and you can do it in any, anywhere you are. It doesn't matter. So that's one that I really, what's that? Helps bond, like helps the bonding and everything with you with your horse. Yeah. So that's something I always try to assess along with, you know, physically what, uh, like where they live, um, what they're eating. I think she said he lives on 10 acres, 10 acres, she said, and he gets acupuncture and massage. Oh, awesome. So I would be massively looking at diet and massively looking at, um, his microbiome for sure. And then treating him homeopathically for like something like PTSD or, or, or decreasing his stress levels when you're doing so. And I know that CBD, I mean, you can use even, even hemp oil has some cannabinoids, right? And hemp oil doesn't test. So, so, um, I'm talking like hemp seed oil, right? So, um, that and, and and just making sure that his gut's not like that he doesn't have an ulcer i can't um, truthfully i mean i'm not diagnosing i'm not saying anything but a horse with that kind of an issue i can't imagine him having a healthy gut Mm -hmm. just because the stress of once he's down like like they're preyed upon right like you have to really think what would he be thinking what would be going through his mind if he can't get up it like they, they they get eaten yeah they get panicked yeah oh he has ulcers all pressure what does it say Kaylin? pressure points positive oh yeah yeah so then you know like i mean i i'm not just saying this but like our our canine gut suit is is really like people were saying with this one horse that i have he was um a really really high high powered hunter jumper was like in the Olympics and the whole nine yards. And he has four fused spine. Like he's got spondylosis and four, like it, the, when I got this horse, he was dragging his back legs and they wouldn't even work with him unless he had a chain over his nose. Like he was, he was, you know, he'd bite you and kick you and strike you. And it was brutal. This is like, a, he's like a different horse. And I treated him for stress I worked on his back with predominantly homeopathy because you, you couldn't touch him. If you even b- tried to brush him with a curry comb, he would he would attack you. That's how sensitive he was to even touch. <laughs> it was insane. So he got homeopathy. I crazy dealt with his gut. I treated him with for PTSD and abuse. He's a different horse. Like he's a completely different horse. Julie, Helena here has a question. Um, and she says, I have recently heard from a veterinarian that probiotics do not work on horses because their intestines are too long. Interesting. <laughs> um, I would say that that doesn't make any sense, really, um, because uh, horses are high in gut fermenters. So they actually, they, they, the whole principle of how they digest their food is actually with bacteria. So the way that you have to get it to the areas that need to have it um, is, is different. Um, and, and it's, that's part of the reason why they have to graze all the time because they need a lot of access to it. They can't just have it, you know, here sporadically once a day. When they're actually eating off the dirt rather than off of gravel in their stall, like when they're eating grazing in real life, it, they're eating dirt the entire day, like 18 hours a day. Um, and that's how they get some of that live bacteria into that hind end of the gut um and if they didn't have bacteria in their gut then they would be dead (laughs) so um they all have some some bacteria but a lot of horses actually have i guess you could say it's like either a microbiome imbalance or a deficiency like they're missing things 
um, because uh, there's a lot of antibiotic use with horses, a lot of preventative, like same with dogs. Um, and whenever you do that, you have to find a way to at least try to replace that. Um, and I know the, the, the potency of the probiotics is really important. And then the, the, how many strains you have is very important as well, because when they are eating dirt, um, like Billy was talking about the other day, like Dirt has thousands and thousands and thousands of microbes, whereas we, can, we could never simulate that. So it's great to be able to, to add a probiotic, but even like if you can't add a probiotic or you don't, you know, you can't afford it or, you, or you're not really sure about it, um, like putting them on grass, dirt <laughs> is a great way to help them and as much as you could possibly do. Um, it's a big factor with horses. They, they really need that and, and that's how they re-inoculate their gut on a regular basis. So they, they do need to have access to that. And if they don't, if he's, if he's on, t is this the same, the same horse as before? Or is this a new horse? No, this is a different, yeah, different okay. person. Well, it applies to both horses. <laughs> so well, yeah, that's, Julie, you can probably well, see. I think, more. I think, so this is how, was it Helene? Right? Helene. So I, I understand, um, I understand what your vet's saying. And I have very strong opinions about that because I feel like, and the re I'm telling you why I have strong opinions about that because I was fined by the vet association and I can't even remember 2000 and four by writing about probiotics helping dogs and I was my vet clinic was fined because I had no proof that that probiotics work for dogs and they're at that point they were they were saying that probi dogs dogs didn't uh, it didn't, they didn't work on dogs, their intestines were too short, and the list went on and on and on. So from my perspective, I think a bunch of reasons why that, why I would support what a vet would say in that way, and that's because there are, there aren't exactly what Sarah said, the potency is not high enough, there's not enough colony forming units to survive. Um, there's not the correct prebiotic, which is massive for, for getting the the bacteria to where it needs to go um and the majority of horses have such inflamed um gi tracts like their their stomachs and their and their intestines are so inflamed because and that's why they get ulcers so much that 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 the quality of the mucosal lining will not house the proper native bacteria so yeah. so yeah from a scientific point of view, I can understand what they're saying. From an empirical point of view, I have to say I disagree 100%. If you're, if you're putting in a good probiotic, a prebiotic and like Larch, which is, which is really good for horses, um, and you're doing like a, a multi-strain, like a 14 strain, and you're on a, an addition supporting the the integrity of the mucosal lining of the stomach and the intestines, you will, you will see massive differences. So from an empirical scientific thing, I can tell you for how many years now that I've been dealing with horses with really bad microbiota and really sick horses, and they are, they are doing incredibly, incredibly well. And I think it's a combination. I say, you're not just dumping in. It's just like when I talk about the overcultured canine, you're not just dumping in probiotics. That's not going to work if they've got leaky gut or they've got ulcers or they've got a really poor mucosal lining or they've got permeability in their gut. It's not going to work dumping in a whole bunch of probiotics. Your vet's right. You've got to look at it from a holistic approach and go, what's going to work? Saying that, I'm, I'm hoping to have a horse strain a specific equine strain out soon. Um, but I can say the same with dogs, right? Like we have a, we have a species oriented canine probiotic that we know a hundred percent stays viable in the gut, in a dog's gut, a hundred percent through, through 
research, through live studies, through um, um, laboratory studies, but, and I'm happy to have like sort of raised that bar when we talk about that, but, I, uh, but I've never said that from an empirical point of view at my, at my vet clinic, how human probiotics still work. They still, they still work because I've seen them work, but they don't work when the, when the colonies are two and three strains or two and three species, right? They don't work unless you have a diverse, diverse strain or diverse species and they don't work in an unhealthy gut. You've got to, you've got to heal their gut no matter how you look at it. So I'm agreeing with them, but then I'm disagreeing with your vet and that's not disrespectful. I just, it's just from working with so many horses and seeing, seeing the difference in it. What's happening now is that probiotics are just sort of getting the big thing with horses, right, Sarah? Yeah, Whereas, yeah. and this is what I was hearing 20 years ago when I started probiotics on dogs and cats. They don't work, da 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 da, da. And it's like, well, yeah, well, actually they do. But we got to be looking at the whole gut, not just, not just probiotics. Yeah. And I also, to add to that, uh, with their gut, uh, physically, like using a supplement that has all those things as well as the probiotic is important because they need, you need to give the gut, uh, nutrients in order to repair itself. Cause it can't just repair itself with nothing. Um, so it needs to, to have that, to be able to actually repair itself, to get to the point where the bacteria want to live there. But the other part, I'm going to bring up emotions again with horses because horses are, you know, like there's so much about the mind gut connection um, and horses are a giant walking gut. <laughs> That's all they are. They are they, they're so gut orientated. They, they hear everything. They see everything. They, they're, they're a prey animal. So they're meant to react to every little thing around them and see all the changes of the day and like so they're highly sensitized and in and, and and that's like on an instinctual level that they're like that and when um they're stressed of course it's gonna be it's gonna show up in the gut because that is their main survival mechanism is their gut. That's how they stay alive in the wild. And, and that's how they actually like know when to run away from things. Um, and it sounds weird, but that's how they operate. So it's really important to make sure like um, when you're assessing your horse um, on a behavioral level, like is your horse really spooky? Cause right off the bat, if they're really spooky, I'm, I usually I'm like, okay, well, we have to work on this to make, to make the horse feel more comfortable because if your horse is spooking all the time, they're, they're trying to tell you they're, they're literally scared all the time. They're running away from things all the time. So they need, you need to break those kind of cycles and, and get them really feeling a lot more comfortable and trusting you. And, um, and that will also help their gut to heal. Um, and, and it will make your supplements work better if you take that aspect out of it. So that's why I always want to look at it, not just from nutritional, not just from training, not just from, because horses, it's so multifaceted. It's really important to, to look at all of those things. Like it's sometimes it's not just, oh, I just really have a spooky horse. Oh, my horse just rears all the time. Like, and he's always going to do that. It's not true. Like, you know, like it could be because your horse is stressed and if they are doing something like that, um, because I feel like horses don't, they don't innately want to hurt us because they, if they're connected to us, they don't want to hurt us. So if they're doing things that are potentially dangerous to us, um, like running us over or we're falling off or, you know, when we're riding them, um, they don't want to do that. And I feel like most horses are not, um, that's not their goal is to try and hurt us. And when they are doing those things, it means that their, their connection with you is not solid enough that they're like, I got to really pay attention to this smaller human that's hanging around with me right now. Like, you know, if they really have a connection with you, they, they will watch it where you are and they'll, they'll always see like, cause that's how horses operate. They know that there's a bird flying over behind their butt. Like they, they always know those things. So those are really important things to see. Like, um, 
is your horse grazing and actually like relaxing or do they jump up and lift their head up all the time and round and then go back to eating or you know those are all really important things and so that's something that I I like to assess so it's it's really hard for me sometimes to ask questions without seeing all the the things that are going on in the in that horse's life that's a homeopathy yeah well and no. I also, <laughs> But it's so different. They're so different than dogs and cats, right? Because dogs and cats are carnivores. <laughs> dogs yeah. and cats eat horses in a way, but like, do you know what I mean? Like lions or lions eat zebras. Like, their 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 whole mechanism is different. Horses yeah. are sentient, sentient yeah. beings. I don't think they're anybody's light animals for a reason, right? Like they they, they, their their survival mechanism is to run yeah, away. To run away. And, yeah. and, and that, that's that fight or flight, right? That, that like run. And we know that that adrenaline mm. instantly affects the gut and it affects the flora. It forces, like it, it, it forces poop out. It forces everything to just leave, evacuate so that you can run and yeah. save your life. Right. So I agree with you hundred percent. If a horse is doing something wrong, they're doing something wrong. 99.9 percent .9 of the time because they're scared mm -hmm. right and they're really stressed like they're really stressed about something that's going on and i i always try to make sure that like i always know that i'm doing too much uh especially with the young horses you you always have to make sure that you're you're stacking things for them that make sense and that are not too hard for them because if you if you introduce things too quickly um, or even a horse that's, you know, been a racehorse its whole life and then you start doing dressage or you maybe do some jumping or you, you always want to make sure that you're, um, if you start seeing behavior using your training, then, um, you have to step back and go back to where they, you know, where they were feeling comfortable and then work from there and, and break it down as like, okay, what, what is it that I need to, um, because they're always trying to tell us what they need. <laughs> and, the, and once you figure out what they need, then they're like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, like now I can, I can go ahead and do this, right? Yeah. Um, we so, can, yeah. We, can we take a, another question quickly? Yes, yes. I was just going to say that if we have time. Uh, Kay Nickerson, she asks, is there any hope for navicular? The vet says it's mm -hmm. due to shoeing versus diet, but not sure. Uh, it's related to many different things. Um, and it, it can be partially genetic. It can be metabolic. It can be, uh, related to shoeing, um, or the lack there of shoes. It can be diet related. Um, and it can be, uh, training related, uh, and age related. So, uh, again, those are all things that I would look at, um, to, I, I know some people get to the point where they want to, you know, their vet says, well, they're done. Now they just have to stand around or, you know, some people euthanize their horses um, over it. So um, again, uh, you know, when you're looking at things from a holistic point of view, um, I think you have a lot more options. Um, so I think that uh, it's worth, it's worth a try because Sometimes just having them in their the conventional box of of uh, what we should be doing with horses, um, and I know there's there's a lot of opinions about how we should be taking care of our horses, but um, yeah, going back to making sure that because inflammation of any type is is often a precursor of either gut related issue, stress related issue, um, and or you know diet training lifestyle and sometimes shoeing but it could be a number of different things so it's usually not one thing on its own but there is hope yes <laughs> and there's lots of hope and i think that that's the you know navicular is notorious and with quarter horses and and mm -hmm. and the, the breeds that they wanted they bred these 15 12 to 1500 pound horses with feet like ballerina right like tiny tiny little feet and I think that that was a and and really standing up right their angles were like 
so they almost looked like they were on cute they had cubes on their feet and i think you pardon reasons to okay so i've had i've had four or five cases of navicular and exactly like you said i just you have to do the entire thing but one thing that I did have to do with navicular for sure that always helped, like I shouldn't say always helped, but I had to do, I had to do with every single case, and that was use an amazing barefoot trimmer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we would we would she would change the angle so slightly, this particular trimmer would put pads on their feet without without um, shoes, right? Mm -hmm. She would use like um, boots, like boots with pads. She would silicone pads on. She would tape pads on um, just to give them some relief. And it's incredible how by changing the angle of the foot, how you can make that rotate back. You can change, you can change their angles as you're dealing with everything else. Like exactly like you said, Sarah, stress, diet, microbiome, the whole, the whole nine yards. I mean, the amount of horses that are on navicular that are on butte, right? Butte or Prevacox or a non sterile anti-inflammatory. And then you're, and, and, and I understandably so, right? Because of the pain, but there's so many other ways for whoever's out there with a uh, horse with navicular. There's so many other ways. Like I, I look at navicular as you got to you got to help them with the pain but then you have to try and and incorporate everything so that you can wean them down off the off the NSAIDs right but without them being in pain so you know i'm homeopathy um herbs that have natural inflammatory properties um finding a but tumor part of what? Uh, making sure that they move a little bit, like even not a lot, but they need to move a little bit. So even yeah. if and on sand too, right? Like soft, really soft ground. Getting them. Yeah. Yeah. So there is definitely, there's lots of hope with navicular. I mean, unless it's completely rotated and coming at the bottom of their foot that, that, nice. um, but, but there is tons of hope for navicular. That's fantastic. We are uh, we are out of time, ladies. We're a couple minutes over, and I know there are people here uh, that want to know more about how they can reach you, Sarah. So, can you tell us a bit um, about where to find yourself? Yeah. So, um, I have a company. It's called Equus Soap Co. It's E Q U U S Soap Co. Um, and I have a website. It's EquusSoapCo.com. Um, you can also reach me via email through the website and, um, uh, also, uh, I guess through, I guess if they, if they can't, if they can't remember that they can always contact you and you can forward it to me as well. well. Sure. Right? I was going to say, Sarah's been writing blogs for us now. I'm so excited. So Sarah's going to yeah. be our, our horse blog girl. And um, I should say woman now, shouldn't I? She's still like <laughs> I'll always be a girl, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so you'll be able to, you know, like on our on our uh, website, her blogs are all on our website, so we'll have contacts for her there. And um, she's got lots of exciting things up coming up. She's got an incredible. I know we're not supposed to say this, but I'm saying it anyway. She's got um, an incredible um, fl natural fly spray for horses and all kinds of cool stuff that I'm hoping that we can support her in because it's it's really important. Um, and they just did put it on the chat, Sarah. Um, one of the one of the moderators put your okay. thing on the chat. Yep. Uh, yep. But um, you can definitely, if you go to, you can get a hold of Sarah through us or through her company. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much, you ladies. I've, I've learned a lot about horses today, so <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone else did as well. <laughs> no, we can, you know, we can have, they, you know, you can have people ask like, yeah, just ask questions directly to you, right? Like email you, get on your yep. website, email you and do consults and things like that. And, yeah, of course. Um, 
I'm hoping to do a lot more with with horses and Sarah. So I'm super duper excited. Yay! Thanks for having me, Julie. Oh, thank you for having. Great fun. But wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody, wait. Tip your head. <laughs> Move your head over so that people can see your paintings. Oh, Move your head. So that's Sarah's. Actually, that's her other thing. Is she's an incredible artist. So she. <laughs> so Sorry, person. I had to spotlight you there. Move your head again. So um, yeah, she's she's really like her heart's in it. I think she's part horse. So, <laughs> I think I am too. <laughs> and I'm part pug, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, have a All great right. night, everybody. Bye. Thanks Bye. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>